Hi friends, my name is Benjamin and today I will tell you another heartbreaking story. On the 2nd of August 2015, a Sunday, 39-year-old Jason Corbett was peacefully asleep at his home in Wahlberg, Davidson County, North Carolina, United States. His household included his wife, Molly Martins, their two children, 10-year-old Jack and 8-year-old Sarah, and Molly's parents, Tom and Sharon Martins. Originally from Limerick, Ireland, Jason had enlisted the help of Molly Martins as an au pair following the tragic death of his first wife, Margaret, who succumbed to an asthma attack. At the time, Molly was 24 years old. Jason, needing assistance in caring for his young children, who were three and a half years old Jack and one and a half years old Sarah, brought Molly from Knoxville, Tennessee, United States to Ireland. Over time, a romantic relationship blossomed between Jason and Molly. In 2011, the family, including Jack and Sarah, relocated to Davidson County, North Carolina, as part of Jason's job as the plant manager for an international packaging company. The same year, Jason and Molly tied the knot. The Corbettes appeared to be leading a fulfilling life in North Carolina. Jason dedicated his efforts to his role at the packaging plant, while Molly took on the responsibilities of caring for the children and also found joy in coaching a children's swimming team. In the early hours of that morning, the 2nd of August, a 911 call was made at 3 a.m. Tom, Molly's father, made the call. He told the operator, My, my, uh, daughter's husband, uh, my son-in-law, uh, got in a fight with my daughter. I intervened, and I, I think, um, and he's in bad shape. We need help. He, he's bleeding all over, and I, I may have killed him. A paramedic team was dispatched to the scene, and Tom and Molly were prompted by the emergency dispatcher to administer CPR until they arrived. Unfortunately, there was nothing to help Jason. He died from multiple blows to his head. Tom and Molly were taken to the police station in separate patrol cars. Molly recounted what happened that night at their home. Around 3 a.m., eight-year-old Sarah came down to her and her husband's bedroom door. She was having nightmares again, and Molly went up to the room with her to comfort her. When Molly returned, Jason was angry about being woken up. From that point on, a row broke out between the couple, and Jason attacked Molly and began choking her. The screaming and noise was heard by Tom. He entered their bedroom with a baseball bat in his hand. Tom, 65, confirmed what his daughter said while sitting in another interview room. He told his wife to stay in the room when he woke up to screams upstairs and decided to find out what was going on. He heard Jason threatening to kill his daughter, so Tom brought along a weapon for protection, a metal bat. Tom entered the bedroom just as Jason was strangling Molly. Tom turned to Jason and asked him to let his daughter go and calm down. He refused to let Molly go, threatening to kill her. Jason turned his back toward the bathroom and began dragging Molly behind him. She resisted, but she was weaker. Tom realized his daughter could not be left alone with the aggressor and hit Jason in the head several times with the bat. However, Jason was able to knock Tom to the floor and took the bat away. Molly, at this point, afraid that Jason might kill Tom, grabbed a decorative garden stone from the bedside table and hit Jason over the head with it. Tom managed to get to his feet due to this pause and grabbed the bat and continued to hit Jason in the head. He stopped when he realized that he was already dead. Tom admitted that he didn't like his son-in-law and his family, previously advising Molly to get a lawyer and file for divorce. Police took photos of Molly and Tom for the report. What's strange is that there were no signs of a struggle, no abrasions or bruises on them. So what really happened at the Corbett house? But first, let me tell you everything in more detail. Molly Martin spent most of her life in the city of Knoxville, Tennessee. She was the only daughter in a family of four children. Her father, Tom, gave 30 years of his life to the FBI, and her mother was a doctor of mathematics. In his spare time, Tom coached soccer for the local children's team, and Molly practiced singing and dancing with friends. She loved to read, and as a teenager often appeared in her mother's book club, where she shared her opinions on what she had read. Sharon and Tom were highly educated and quite wealthy. After high school, Molly decided to pursue a medical degree, 
enrolling at Clemson University in South Carolina in 2003. Studying turned out to be very difficult and required a lot of hard work and effort. She soon dropped out of the university. In early 2007, Molly began dating Keith Magan, and they moved in together a couple months later. Molly worked as a nanny and also taught children to swim, and her boyfriend worked at a local nonprofit organization. Their relationship with Molly developed quickly. She was fun, happy, and carefree. However, they both suffered from mental health issues. Molly had been diagnosed with depression and had warned Keith before she started her relationship with him that she was bipolar. Things were fine at first, Keith notes. Medication helped her with her mental health issues, but then she contracted Staphylococcus aureus. The medication for the infection seemed to block the effects of the medication for the bipolar disorder, which threw Molly out of her usual equilibrium. It was a very difficult period, as Keith said. Molly suffered from migraines and insomnia. She spent a lot of time soaking in the bathtub, sometimes just crying while lying there on the floor. At one point, Molly was taking 16 pills a day. She was unable to continue babysitting and stayed at home. Keith took over, fully providing for them both, even though he wasn't earning much. Molly was now depressed, and every time he came home, he didn't know what was waiting for him behind that door. The relationship became strained. After a while, she got better, and Molly kept saying that she wanted to get engaged to Keith. He took this step for her, thinking it might improve her condition. But he was wrong. It didn't help, and neither did her desire to have children. Molly got pregnant from Keith, however. She suffered an early miscarriage in September 2007. The following February, there was no improvement in her condition, and Molly's parents paid for her stay in the psychiatric unit at Emory Hospital in Atlanta. Here she was to be helped to stabilize her condition and prescribed the correct course of medication. Four days later, she returned to Keith and they tried to continue living together. By the end of February, there was a rift in the couple's relationship, and Molly simply told Keith one night that she wanted to go somewhere in Europe and work there as a live-in nanny. He didn't think she should go away, much less work with children, since she couldn't even go grocery shopping on her own. Soon Molly left for Ireland, and Keith never saw her again. Molly says that this babysitting job came at a very important time for her. She was suffering from feelings of inadequacy after leaving university and didn't know who she was or who she wanted to be. She was fortunate to meet Jason, who helped her come to her senses and realize her importance in caring for his children. A few months later, Jack and Sarah started calling her mom. Living in Ireland, Molly missed her native land, so after her engagement, she proposed to Jason to marry in America and live there, to which he agreed. Tracy Lynch, Jason's sister, with whom they were always very close, says that the Molly they knew in Ireland and the same in the States are two different people. When relatives from Ireland came to Tennessee for the ceremony, they noticed Molly's strange behavior. She tried to control everything, was often angry, and was not like those happy brides anticipating marriage. Sometimes she stayed in bed and would not talk to anyone. Jason's family began to question whether he should become part of this American family, and his best friend saw the unhappy groom in front of him. He even told him to just leave, to get on a plane and return to his home country, but Jason replied that he couldn't do that. He had already made a commitment. Four years later, Molly was very close to Jason's children and even considered them her own, but her relationship with her husband was strained. Tracy says that recently, back in 2014, Jason had been planning to move back home. He wasn't happy here and had started gaining weight. Molly was acting strangely, and he didn't like some of the things going on at home. He missed Ireland and said it would be hard for him to get out when Molly found out he wanted to. His children called her mom, but he wouldn't let her become their legal guardian. Jason didn't want to use his wife's citizenship to make a visa for himself, that way she would have no legal grounds to claim custody of the children if they later divorced. She later confessed to several of her friends about the abuse by her husband. Neighbors began to keep a closer eye on Jason. There was no visible corroboration of Molly's words, according to numerous testimonies. There were no abrasions, bruises, or other injuries, 
and she did not appear to be a victim of abusive behavior, not withdrawn or haggard. On the contrary, she didn't seem afraid of him. Jason, on the other hand, didn't fit the image of a tyrant. He was friendly, outgoing, generous. The Corbett's closest neighbor reported that Molly had said things that didn't fit the big picture he knew and were most likely false. She herself admitted that she may have lied to others to make herself look good and not be ashamed of her words or actions. On August 2nd, still dressed in her pajamas after the bedroom fight, Molly answered detectives' questions and reported that Jason had abused her. She'd gone to the hospital several times, but never admitted how she got the injuries. Her husband was verbally and emotionally abusive. According to her, he sometimes sincerely apologized to her. It seemed like things were supposed to get better in their relationship. But the abuse continued, and each time the situation only got worse. Despite this, her love for Sarah and Jack kept her from leaving him. Molly added that she never told about her husband's abuse because the children were not her own and were not U.S. citizens. Jason could have taken them away from her. Several years ago, fearing that no one would believe Jason's abuse, Molly, on the advice of her attorney, began using hidden recording devices and says many of the recordings she collected have been destroyed or lost, but those that remain have been turned over to prosecutors. For example, on a recording titled, Jason Comes Home Late, December 2013, he finds the door locked and rings the bell repeatedly. She opens it within 39 seconds and apologizes. You never mean to do anything, do you? He asks angrily, then mocks her. Molly pleads. Multiple smacking sounds can be heard, and she begins to whimper. I hate you, she sobs quietly before the recording cuts out. She says Jason had a key, but was too drunk to get the door open, and as often happened in their home, the fury would just rise and rise and rise until whatever was going on was all my fault. Four days after their father's death, 10-year-old Jack and 8-year-old Sarah were interviewed twice by state authorities. The interview was conducted by an authorized social worker. The children described their father's aggression, ongoing problems in their parents' marriage, alleged verbal, emotional, and physical abuse on his part. And perhaps more importantly in all of this, the children understood and recognized these problems. Sarah, in response to questions, explained that mom didn't want to wake dad up or he would get very angry and say, why are you waking me up? Jack had witnessed the use of physical force by his father on one or two occasions. The social worker asked a very important question to summarize what was said. Did anyone teach them or ask them to answer certain questions in a certain way? Sarah answered, My mom asked me to only tell the truth. A few years earlier, Jason had designated Tracy as the legal guardian of his children in the event of his death. She knew Molly wouldn't give them up without a fight. Tracy immediately flew to North Carolina and petitioned for custody of the children, and Molly did the same. Sixteen days after Jason's death, Tracy became the guardian of Jack and Sarah, and they moved back to Ireland. In January 2016, Tom and Molly were charged with second-degree murder. Tracy believes that Molly learned of Jason's plans to return to Ireland with the children, but without her. Then a plan was devised to get rid of him. Molly had long wanted only her children, not her husband. In July 2017, Molly and Tom went on trial for the murder of Jason Corbett. The prosecution offered a very different story of what happened, which did not include a narrative of strangulation and self-defense. Prosecutors relied almost entirely on forensic evidence, which included photographs of Jason's body and gruesome signs of a struggle in the bedroom. According to the pathologist's report, Jason was struck at least 12 times in the head. The exact number could not be given because he was hit in the same spot over and over again. The skull shows noticeable cracks and severe bruising, comparable to injuries sustained by someone who has fallen from a great height or been in a car accident. A blood spatter expert says that at one point in time, Jason's head was 30 or 45 centimeters off the floor and he continued to be struck. 
According to prosecutors, Jason was first struck while he was still in bed, sedated. Jason's system, as confirmed by toxicology tests, contained a sedative prescribed in Molly's name two days before the tragedy. Also, Jason's $600,000 insurance policy had been changed about a year ago. Molly was now the sole beneficiary. Jurors were additionally shown photos of the defendants taken at the station on the night of August 2nd. Tom and Molly did not have a scratch on them. It was impossible to get into the fight Molly described with a man bigger, stronger, and taller than you and not get a scratch or a bruise. Presumably, Tom and Molly were delaying the 911 call, making up their story for the police while Jason's body was cooling on the floor. This thought was made as paramedics who arrived at the Corbett home noted the low temperature of his body. It was already cold. There was no disclosure of abusive behavior on Jason's part at trial. In general, the issue of domestic violence was minimally discussed during the trial. Tom, in his testimony, claimed that Jason had a great deal of control over Molly. He noticed bruises on her body but could not understand where they came from, although he admitted that he had never seen physical aggression on Jason's part except on that August night. Before sentencing, Molly said, Incidents like August 2nd happened quite regularly. The only difference is that this time my father was in the house. In defense of his clients, the attorney pointed to a photo from the station where Molly had a red mark on her neck, confirming strangulation. Two weeks before the incident, Jason had a standard physical exam, and the doctor claimed he had been under stress lately. He complained of uncontrollable outbursts of unreasonable anger. The autopsy found marks on Jason's left arm, indicating that he was defending himself, but not on his right arm, which he allegedly used to hold Molly by the neck. Nine days of testimony, arguments, photos from the scene of the tragedy, and the jury left to deliberate after spending less than five hours in the room. They found Tom and Molly guilty. Both received sentences of 20 to 25 years in prison, the court ruled. A few days after the verdicts were announced, the lawyers filed an objection to the court's decision, the main argument being judicial errors. In particular, incorrect actions of the jury. They violated the judge's instructions. Even before the verdict was announced, one of the jurors gave an interview and said to journalists that some of them had already discussed the case in private conversations, which is strictly prohibited. But the court denied the motion. In January 2019, the appeals court only allowed the defense and prosecution to present oral arguments in Molly and Tom's case. The defendants themselves were not in the courtroom. Each side had only half an hour to present their main arguments. On February 4, 2020, the North Carolina Court of Appeals reversed Tom and Molly's conviction and ordered a new trial, specifically because, among other errors in the first trial, evidence that Jason may have been violent toward Molly was excluded. A year later, the North Carolina Supreme Court upheld the appellate court's decision, despite a challenge filed by the state. It ruled that the exclusion of certain evidence at trial and the erroneous inclusion of others may have prevented Tom and Molly from presenting a meritorious defense, and their words of self-defense thus had little evidentiary basis. In turn, the jury was not fully informed about the evidence, and they were unable to fulfill their constitutional function. In all, Molly and Tom spent 44 months behind bars and were released on $200,000 bail each in April 2021. It is important to note, with so much emphasis on interviews given by two young children shortly after their father had just died, and while in the custody of Molly's family, that both Jack and Sarah have since recanted the statements they made. They said that they were coached to lie about domestic abuse. They have since told the Davidson County District Attorney's Office from their residence in Ireland that Molly coerced them into making those statements which were completely false and that it was actually Molly who had been abusive. In November 2023, a new trial took place where the judge ordered Molly Martins and her father Thomas to prison for a minimum of seven months. After an emotional final day of sentencing hearings, the pair were led out of a North Carolina court in handcuffs on Wednesday, 
receiving sentences ranging from 7 to 30 months for the voluntary manslaughter of Jason Corbett. This is in addition to the three and a half years Molly and Thomas have already served after previously being convicted of murder. What do you think about this story? Share your opinion in the comments. Thanks for watching and for being with me. Take care of yourself and your loved ones.